Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to talk about an important topic like a lot of people have been asking me uh, is like how Sri Lanka can make the transformation uh, to a developed economy by 2048. So I want to talk about Sri Lanka, uh, the path to a developed country by 2048. So it's not something that's going to become easy. It has a lot of uh, roadblocks on the way. But as a nation, if you're going to do things the right way, I think we can attain that. So with that, I just want to uh, divide my talk into five parts. So first, I'm going to talk about where is Sri Lanka very briefly. And then uh, we'll talk about the growth needed to be an advanced economy by 2048. And the other thing is, before I want to touch on the reforms, I also want to talk about we see a lot of uh, people saying that you know we are in an open free market economy, and but still we have gone into a crisis. So we just want to briefly touch on whether the question is, are we a free market economy? Did we really open in 1977? And then I'll talk about the structural reforms, about 12 of them. And finally, we'll come on to what is the path ahead. So first of all, uh, speaking about where is Sri Lanka right now. So all of you all were present here last year. So our problems still persist, the long-term issues. But as a whole, in the short term, I think our situation has uh, gotten much better. There is stability. Inflation has been brought under control. Interest rates are coming down. And even growth, we are projected to go into about 3 to 4% uh, next year and in the coming years. Though that is not enough, but that is still stability as a whole. And uh, so here we, so where do we take this forward? So right now, stability, that is not something we can enjoy for a long time. Because what most people don't know is during our past 75 years, our government debt to GDP has gone to 128%, uh, which is an extremely large uh, percentage. Even countries which the IMF has been very strict on, like Ghana, Zambia, even their rate is only around 70-60%. Uh, so we are at 128%. So just having stability and being comfortable is not going to take us anywhere. So we have to rapidly get down and start walking to stay in the same place. So here, uh, the IMF program, of course, during the program, things are going to get slower. But we really need to accelerate after 2028. So. Uh, here again, I just want to talk about, so where are we right now? So if you look at countries which go into IMF programs uh, or who did the hard reforms, like India or Thailand, they never went back to the IMF after that. So even countries such as Chile, they never got themselves bankrupted. But of course, one or two times they may have gone. So generally, but Sri Lanka is a different case. You know, Sri Lanka and Chile were the earliest among the developing countries to open their economies. But if you look at Chile, it's an advanced economy, 16,000 GDP per capita. Sri Lanka, right now, unfortunately, we're a bankrupt nation, 3,000. We are one-fifth of what Chile is. And we didn't start off that way. You know, uh, uh, when we got independence, Sri Lanka was considered the Switzerland of Asia, or considered one of the top three economies in Asia. So here we are at this stage. So the blame sometimes is on, is it because we opened our economy? So my thing is, I would say we did open our economy, but not fully. So in 1977, I'll give a number of reasons. One is it was not, not done wholeheartedly, you know, halfway. The reason is because if you look at Sri Lanka, we are one of the most protected economies in the world. So for example, trade facilitation, in trade, trade facilitation, the ease with which you can import, we are even worse than some African countries, sub-Saharan African countries. So. Uh, you wouldn't really call yourself an open market economy and at the same time have the tag word most protected economy. So that's a contradiction. The second thing is uh, we have 527 state-owned enterprises. So most countries which liberalize usually uh, restructure or in most cases commercial state-owned enterprises are privatized. That thing we in 1977 we did not do. So that is another drag. Because uh, I'll come back to this later, because over 100 of state-owned enterprises have commercial interests. I'm not talking about uh, education institutes and others. I mean, these have to be under the government control. But hotels, airlines, uh, 
you know, supermarkets. Uh, so when there is that, there is a lot of government interference. So again, the question of a liberal economy, at the same time, the government being the policymaker and the regulator also being there, you know, it's a bit of a contradiction. So here again, uh, reinforcing the argument that we, if we had opened our economy properly, we wouldn't have been in the crisis to a whole. Is that we did it half-heartedly. Reforms were, we took a, a couple of steps in front, then a step behind. You know, most countries, if you look at countries like India, Thailand, Chile, they don't have this argument whether privatization is good or not. You know, they have gone past those. So here again, after half a century of opening our economy, we still have those questions. So uh, with that, I want to talk about uh, some of the structural reforms that are needed. So uh, if you want to uh, become an advanced economy, there are some uh, hard reforms that we need to do. Uh, like, for example, I want to talk about just 12 reforms, broad reforms, though there are a lot more, but with the limited time that have to be done. One is, the first thing is, of course, education, being in an education institute. So uh, the last book I read was by Ray Dalio. He is the CEO of the world's largest hedge fund, a Wall Street person. So what he did was he did a book to study how empires grew up and down. Like the first was the Dutch Empire, which almost ruled the world, then the British Empire, and now we are under the dominance of the US Empire, or you can call it the superpower. So here again, a number of things were in common for them to dominate the world. One was capital markets. They had the most dominant stock, stock exchanges. The second was a large navy. And uh, the other was the reserve currency. So these were. But the thing that propelled them or initiated their rise was education. Without education, none of these countries would have risen up. So this is where the fundamental. Uh, where we have to uh, focus on. So even if you look at, for example, South Korea, there what they did in the 1960s, they wanted to industrialize. The first thing they did was education. And they focused a lot on uh, STEM education. So here again, uh, we find a stat that a 1% increase in STEM graduates results in a 1% increase in GDP. So uh, here again, uh, when you look at Sri Lanka, we find even when compared to a country such as India, we India has eight times when you look at per million STEM graduates. So those are essential. If you, a recent study with around 97 countries found that Sri Lanka did extremely good when it comes to arts and humanities, which is good, uh, which we are all in. But when it comes to STEM graduates, we are very inadequate. Only around 5,000 graduates come out every year. Uh, out of that, 1,000 leave the country. So that is the uh, state of the country uh, at the moment. So. Here again, we need to uh, focus on this. So right, I also serve on the Enterprise Operations Committee at Moratua University. So here again, we find that certain other skills are also essential. Like, for example, you find them with a lot of technical skills, but lacking in soft skills, like communications, uh, collaboration. Those are things that are going to come hand in hand, like two wheels for a bicycle. Uh, so uh, with that, that is the most uh, the first and very important reform would be the education system. Because we find that even uh, uh, graduates coming out of, uh, sorry, A-level students who are eligible to go into universities, only 23% of them get a spot in the 16 state universities. That's 77% who don't get a spot. That's 130 to 150,000 students, Sri Lankan students every year who, don't, who, are, who have done well but can't find a spot. So they are all, these are underutilized labor. Right now, only 50% of our labor is with a job or looking for a job. The other almost 8 million people come in the other category. So that's education. The second thing is, of course, uh, the independence of the central bank. So about two days ago, my article for the International Monetary Fund was published on this, where we look at the Central Bank Act and the importance of it. So here again, Recently, uh, last year, I co-wrote an article with uh, former minister Kabir Hashim on this, on a number of reforms for Chatham House London, the global uh, think tank. So out of the 10 odd reforms that we put, the number one was the independence of the central bank. Uh, because uh, the reasons are, one is, if people know, the government, uh, put it in simple terms, spends more than it gains. So as we all know, for any business or even a household, this is not sustainable. Uh, you know, we cannot keep spending more than what we get. 
And even when you look at the primary budget surplus, that is taking away interest payments, even then the Sri Lankan government has not been able to balance its budget for 71 out of 75 years, only four times. So that's since independence we have had this sort of indiscipline. So a primary reason is of course borrowing and at the same time going to the central bank which has been monetary financing. So mostly printing money. So when you print money it means there is a larger supply, money supply in the market. Consistently higher inflation rates. So when you have high inflation that is proven with the rest of the region we have consistently had higher inflation rates. Higher inflation rates means interest rates are higher because for the real interest rates to be positive interest rates have to be higher which means that borrowing costs are higher so sri lankan businesses have been constantly at a disadvantage because of higher borrowing costs due to inflation and most of our savings also of course a lot of people obviously who don't know much uh, knowledge about finance go and put in a fixed deposit saying that you know we get 15 20 percent interest but they don't realize that inflation itself is eating away the most of the money so the government is, has been putting an inflationary tax for us for decades through this. So to prevent that, you have the Central Bank Act, where the Central Bank cannot print money. Unless, of course, uh, to, when the GDP expands in proportion, you can do that. But uh, generally, uh, to have an independent policy where you focus only on price stability. Because the most important thing in an economy, in my opinion, would be the money we hold, the value of the money. So if the value of the money keeps deteriorating, no economy can sustain in the long term. So the Central Bank Act, the new one, has focused on price stability. That means the focus of the Central Bank will be entirely keeping the value of money uh, strong so that we can all circulate it uh, uh, in a valuable way. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, so that is uh, one area we need to uh, focus on. And I think it's been done, though Without support, I think uh, maybe with a populist government, we might have that reverse. So it is always important for the people to make sure these reforms stay put. With that, I want to talk on the third point. The third thing is uh, tax revenue. So here again, if you want to become an advanced nation, there are a lot of theories going around you know, social media that you know tax cuts lead to this. But a London School of Economics study, for five decades they have studied countries uh, show that you know tax cuts generally don't lead to economic growth but rather only help a few very wealthy people at the top so this whole notion about tax cuts that is uh, which can lead to economic uh, drive is a bit questionable so a lot of advanced countries have quite a high tax uh, policy uh, here again uh, Sri Lanka as a whole has one of the lowest government revenue to GDP ratios in the world at 8% so this was not always the case. When we had uh, former president Ranasinghe Premadasa, it was at around 20%. So we were having a very good tax net. And he was able to do a lot of things. He was able to provide welfare schemes, gamudava, building houses, a lot of uh, 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 other schemes were done, like helping the poor. It, it, uh, infrastructure building was done. Remember, this was at a time when there were two wars, one in the north and one in the south with the insurrection. So here again, a primary reason was that uh, the Premadasa regime, a senior Premadasa regime, was able to have a higher rev tax revenue. So they were able to also spend. So uh, this sort of went down over time. You know, they, back then we were looking at uh, tea, rubber, and coconut. But then came the sort of tax exemptions. So when other countries such as China, in order to attract foreign investment, they focused more on infrastructure development, ease of doing business, like Vietnam. What we did was we kept all that in place and instead started to uh, draw people in through tax incentives. So that led to us coming down to around 7.3% uh, in 2019 which is a big reason why we uh, sort of defaulted uh, on our thing. Because uh, with the latest tax cuts in 2019 by the previous regime, we lost access to international capital markets and had to start using reserves to uh, pay back, which eventually led to our default. So here again, the primary reason was uh, uh, you know, lower tax uh, uh, revenues. So the uh, so thing is, like I would say, 36% is quite high at the moment, but at the same time, the base is quite low. 
if you look at, uh, for example, income tax, uh, only 300,000 tax files for 21 million people. And even that, only 60,000 actually are active or pay anything. So here again, a large portion of Sri Lanka's taxes come from indirect taxes, such as VAT and others, which affect the poor more, because the poor and the rich consume most of the products the same, like food products and others, in an equal quantity. So they are paying almost the equal as some of the richest people in Sri Lanka. So it's sort of an unfair thing. And previously, before the IMF program, with all the subsidies, it was like some farmer in Monaragala or maybe Jaffna was paying a sort of an indirect VAT tax, which was funding uh, for somebody in a land cruiser in Colombo 7 to drive uh, with subsidized petrol. So that is what a lot of people, including the World Bank, the IMF, is saying. This is very unfair. We should have direct cash transfers. Uh, so, so, uh, so with that, I think uh, increasing tax revenues over a time by increasing the base and uh, optimizing it better will lead to us spending more on infrastructure because a large number of our spending goes to recurrent expenditure. So we need to spend on more institutions, such as education, uh, healthcare, infrastructure, digital infrastructure. So for that, we need money. All right. Uh, this, the fourth point is I want to talk about trade liberalization. So here, again, like I mentioned before, though we claim to be an open free market economy, we are one of the most protected economies in the world. And trade facilitation is even worse than most least developed countries. Let's also face the fact that with the exception of Maldives, Sri Lanka is still the richest country per capita in South Asia. So we still have the dominant uh, uh, position here and we should be doing much better than this. So a comparison is Chile and Sri Lanka. So Chile and Sri Lanka opened their economy at the same time roughly the same time, and were one of the earliest from the developing countries to open. So as I mentioned, there are two differences here. Chile has 46 free trade agreements, or trade agreements as a whole, 46. Sri Lanka, three. So even the one with Singapore, you know, protests not to implement it. So here again, that's where we sort of uh, went wrong. If you look at countries such as, uh, for example, Argentina, Argentina was, in the early 1900s, the fifth largest economy in the world. And at that time, they were going to almost, some said, become a better economy than the US. But what went wrong was the, the whole notion about import substitution. You know, trying to be self-sufficient, trying to produce everything within the borders, which simply doesn't work. So what Argentina did was most of their industries became comfortable as the governments put high barriers. So there was lack of innovation. They started focusing more on the uh, the domestic market, which resulted in their industrial base becoming, becoming uncomfortable, uh, sorry, uh, being uncompetitive on the global scene. And therefore, they still had to import, you know, their policy was they could import, uh, uh, you know, uh, the capital goods and intermediate goods and not the consumed goods, they weren't going to manufacture it here. But that didn't work, you know, for that they had to start taking loans, debt piled up which is the same thing which happened to Sri Lanka as well. So here again, a lot of focus goes away. Argentina, in order to try to produce everything within their borders, they lost focus on their successful agriculture sector. So that went down. They didn't focus much on copper exports, which Chile used to, uh, to a great extent to develop. So these are a number of factors we need to work on. And uh, talking about trade, I see a lot of uh, politicians, especially from uh, all sorts of parties coming on talk shows and talking about Vietnam as an example. But you know, like I said, Sri Lanka has three free trade agreements. Vietnam has 26. So that is one point that we, uh, I don't know, knowing or unknowingly uh, like to forget. So here again, this whole notion that in Sri Lanka there is that we can produce everything A to Z inside the country and export, that is a thing of the past. You know, after the 80s, with globalization, 70% of global trade is supplying global value chains. It's like for large multinational companies like Apple, Toyota, Nissan. So trying to find a niche and getting there to add value with the comparative advantage a country has. So this is something that, this is how countries such as Vietnam and China are doing. You know, China in the early 80s used uh, cheap labor to become an exporting hub, but now they have moved into value addition. You know, even if you look at an iPhone or a normal phone, 
China is probably, as everybody would agree, one of the greatest manufacturing superpowers in the world. You know, China can produce everything. But even an iPhone, China needs to import components from 43 different countries to produce. So if that is the case, how can a country such as Sri Lanka, you know, do everything A to Z within? So even our successful garment industry, for $100 we export, $60 we import. So trying to substitute everything and producing within a country, which is not just something with the end of the Soviet Union, that has been sort of like uh, put away with. The argument has gone down. So we need to look at progressive ways to come up. And uh, so uh, another few facts is, uh, in order to develop, we need uh, foreign direct investment. So if you look at global exports, 64% of global exports is done by multinational companies, 64%. If you look at knowledge intensive exports, which we need to focus on because we don't no longer have cheap labor, uh, we are a sort of a middle income country and soon with growth we will go into upper middle income, we still, we cannot uh, start manufacturing at a lower base. So we need to look at knowledge intensive exports, higher end. So when it comes to knowledge intensive uh, manufacturing, 82% of global exports are done by multinational companies. So even if you look at Vietnam, Vietnam, 70% of Vietnam's exports come from firms which have foreign direct investment. So it's not local companies that are doing most of the exports, it's multinational companies and local companies which have foreign investments. So that is the way to move forward if we are going to take a playbook here. Because it's brand, R&D, those also matter. Like a good example always cited is, for example, Foxconn, which produces almost everything for Apple. And Apple, which is the most valuable company in the world, Apple is valued at $3 trillion, the size of India's economy, and Foxconn is just 60 billion. So, I think 50 billion. So, Apple is 60 times more valuable than uh, Foxconn, but Apple doesn't manufacture anything. They only do the R&D, designing and branding. So, they just sit in California, they do that. These people do all the hard work, but they are valued at $3 trillion. Foxconn is valued at 60 billion, uh, 50 billion, sorry. So 60 times the value. So here is where we need to. So we have great minds here. You know, Sri Lankans have gone out into the world and achieved great things. Like we have a former uh, World Bank chief economist. We have done uh, so well, our Sri Lankans. So, so I think we have the sort of the human capital to do this. If we can sort of put this as a policy priority. And uh, and to look at trade, uh, speaking about trade, 40% of global trade is concentrated trade. So most of the products come from uh, about three or less countries. So here again, the reason like soybean from the US and Brazil or semiconductors from Taiwan. So here again, trying to export, trying to be competitive on all products does not really work. So we need to find out where, for example, Costa Rica, they focused mostly on medical exports. And they became successful. They found that niche and then all the medical companies sort of came and headquartered there. But here Sri Lanka, we still don't know where we specialize on. We still haven't moved away from the uh, apparel sector. So uh, with that, uh, talking about, uh, I'll just move on to the next topic, the fifth one, would be state-owned enterprises. So here again, there is reform needed. So this is a topic which most uh, people, especially political uh, parties, tend to avoid because it's not a very popular thing to talk about. Uh, so here again, when you look at, for example, this year, about 40% of government revenue went to paying salaries and pensions. In 2021, 86% of government revenue went to paying salaries and pensions. So this is not a bad thing. What I mean to say is we have 1.4 million people in the public sector. So this results in very capable people in the public sector not being able to be paid uh, properly. So we find a lot of talented people who want to serve the country, but naturally either go to the private sector or move abroad. So that is one reason why uh, uh, we, are, uh, we need uh, reforms in these areas. The other is, of course, as I mentioned, about 100 state-owned enterprises are competing with the private sector. So in industries such as banking, industry, uh, uh, insurance, hotels like Hilton, Yaline, line uh, though that's a monopoly, at least uh, from Sri Lanka's perspective. Uh, so here again, 
it's a bit difficult to attract foreign investors or even local investors when you know the government of the country, which is the regulator and the policy maker, is in direct competition with uh, your business. And it's not just competition with, from a policy wise, but also they have sort of unlimited, uh, uh, what can you say, sort of a blank check from the treasury, or at least they had. Uh, like for example, whatever the losses, the treasury would uh, fund them. So this meant that it was a very unequal environment. The private sector, obviously, that is the reason why we haven't been able to attract much FDI. Singapore being a much smaller country, you know, even at uh, earlier stages when they were developing, they were attracting much more per GDP. So this is uh, uh, another reason. So unfair uh, competition. And, and the, the last point especially has been the large amount of losses for example, heavy losses. So this has resulted mostly in either monetary financing, as I spoke about the central bank financing it, leading to inflation, or borrowing from the two public banks. So when you borrow from the public banks, it means that the private sector does not have enough to uh, finance themselves. So if you look at uh, the, early, uh, the early 2000s, oh, the, the percentage of lending to the private sector was 50%. To the public sector, it was, uh, uh, sorry, it was uh, private sector was 80%, and public sector was just 20%. But now, the public sector from 20% uh, has gone up to 50%. So this can just keep going on. The private sector lending by banks has gone down from 80% to 20, uh, 50%. So there is a sort of a crowding out effect. It's becoming more costlier, and there are lack of, uh, finance for the private sector to grow. That has to be the engine of growth. So coming on to the sixth point, we talk about entrepreneurship development. So this is something that's very, very essential for any country. So entrepreneurship development. So as you know, as I mentioned, we have 1.4 million people working for the public sector. So this is, uh, whether it's good or bad, there is no room to expand this further, as the government itself with the IMF program are trying to cut down. So the only way is the private sector to be the engine of growth. So there are two ways for the private sector to grow. One is existing companies for them to expand, or for new companies to come in. So with such a low level of entrepreneurs in the country, it's very difficult to sort of uh, grow the private sector. So obviously, there is a sort of a roadblock when it comes to uh, creating jobs. So here again, there are a lot of issues here. One is access to finance, uh, scaling, uh, entrepreneurship skills, those are certain things that we need to work on. And also the sort of uh, <coughs> a mindset, uh, mindset shift, because even uh, uh, from Sri Lankan homes, most people are encouraged to take a job rather than start their own businesses. So this is not something that we see in uh, other countries such as the US where people are actively asked to <coughs> start businesses of their own. So here again, we see a lack of job creators. So we have a large number of job seekers, but every entrepreneur created is somebody who's gonna create a job, four to five jobs, even if it's a small, medium enterprise. <coughs> so that is something that we need to do. The other thing is ease of doing business and formalizing the economy. So that's a seventh point. So when it comes to ease of doing business, we rank 99th in the world. So that's not a good spot to be in. So if you come and look at uh, business law enforcement, we uh, stand at 162nd in the world. So even a simple court case, like your check gets returned or something, according to the World Bank, uh, you go to the courts, business court in Colombo, it takes four years on average. So no foreign investor or even local investor, you know, it's not a conducive environment to work in. The costs are also high. <coughs> Sometimes the cost to retrieve the money is higher than uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, refund that you're trying to get. So this is the way our ease of doing business is uh, here. So here again, you know, opening and closing businesses. So you know, when it comes to, for example, ranking number one on the ease of doing business is New Zealand. So in New Zealand, it takes half a day to register a company. In the UAE, Dubai, and others, it takes very less time to open. But in Sri Lanka, at least on paper, it takes two weeks. To close a limited liability company, it takes almost a year. So here again, a lot of people don't tend to register a limited liability company because of these reasons. You know, if you can just make those easier, a lot will do. Due to this, 
a large portion of our economy is informal. When you have it as informal, it's difficult to collect taxes and also it's a disadvantage for the employees because when you formalize the economy with a limited liability company or a public limited company, the workers get the EPF and ETF. In an informal thing, you know, those are mostly forgotten. So here again is a reason why we need to push more businesses into the formal sector. That is good for the government, that is good for the employees, and generally good for the businesses too. Once they are formal, they are able to attract better investment, banks are more willing to lend to them. So these are things that is not exactly communicated to the business sector. Eighth thing and a very important thing I have worked on, written for the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, is uh, gender empowerment. So here again, we have around the world, uh, there is a huge potential when it comes to empowering women. So even a study by McKinsey shows that if we can not just, uh, not even make it equal, but even close to equal, we can add $28 trillion to the global economy. That's almost as the size of China uh, and probably Japan and Germany's economy added there. So even if you use that calculation in Sri Lanka, we can basically grow our economy by 25 to 30% using that uh, same model. I don't know how much it will work. But uh, when you compare it to Sri Lanka, the numbers may differ, but roughly around that much. So even if you look at, for example, studies by Harvard and others, they find that women are actually better than men when it comes to many skills, like leadership skills, innovation, and corporate boards and others, they function better with greater gender equality. Not only that age, uh, uh, equality, uh, you know, ethnicity is working. So generally diversity is good for businesses. So especially this is something that uh, we need to uh, heavily work on. And also even if you look at from the entrepreneurship's perspective, there is a sort of a disparity here. Because when you look at the micro level, a large portion, even a majority of the businesses are female owned. But when you look at the very large percent, only 5% of large companies are owned by women. 95% are owned by men. So here again, what we need is scaling uh, businesses, making them move on. Micro level female owned businesses should be pushed to uh, small. Small should be pushed to medium. So a mechanism to do that, that will be hugely, because right now it's a huge potential that we are not utilizing well. Moving on to uh, green energy. So here again, as the uh, president himself mentioned that, uh, you know, we can add around 100 gigawatts uh, to the grid uh, soon with the correct policies done. So myself and uh, uh, former climate minister of Norway, Eric Solheim, we both co-wrote an article on how green energy has the potential to help debt-ridden countries. So here again, we find a lot of uh, potential when it comes to Sri Lanka. One is offshore wind energy. So one factor is offshore wind energy. We have potential that exceeds our demand. So just that alone in renewable. The other thing is solar and uh, even hydropower. So especially with uh, the plans to sort of connect the grid with India and India rising and if we can produce with the correct policies and investments, we could even become a net energy exporter. With the government also focusing on green hydrogen, that will be a better way of exporting uh, because green hydrogen is more of a storage and transmission. So even to countries uh, such as uh, Southeast Asian countries, the ASEAN countries. So here again, there's a huge potential uh, when it comes to renewable energies. And not only that, but also it's better for our uh, balance of payments as well. Because a large portion of our imports go for importing energy. And not only that, our economy is, uh, you know, heavily affected by fluctuating energy prices. You know, oil prices go up or down. A lot of things, prices go up and down. So the, even the central bank is you know, finds it hard to control inflation. So moving to renewable energy is one area that I think we should be more self-sufficient uh, in. The 10th point I want to talk about is, uh, of course, uh, uh, the IMF has also talked about is corruption. <coughs> so we are the first country in Asia to have done a diagnostic report, which emphasizes the importance of corruption uh, in this. So. People tend to just think that corruption is something like bribery, but there is also corruption at the higher levels. Like for example, policy corruptions. Like at the larger level, 
entirely shifting sort of certain business uh, or economic policies in order to benefit certain people. So this level of corruption is more damaging. And uh, but uh, at the same time, I also want to make the point that there is sort of a uh, sort of a misinformation that uh, I would say people say that you know corruption is the greatest uh, uh, sorry the biggest issue in the country and solving that would solve most of our problems that is definitely not true uh, because uh, if you look at a study by Transparency International uh, Bangladesh and uh, sorry Indonesia are more corrupt than Sri Lanka and they are showing six to seven percent GDP growth so corruption is one of the problems it is not the whole problem so even if we solve even if you become an entirely corrupt free country, we still have to solve our fiscal deficit, our tax targets, most of these other issues. So uh, 11th point, uh, coming to my last two points, is land and labor reforms. So here again, calling yourself uh, an open liberal economy, but the government owns 82% of Sri Lanka's land. So here again, heavy interference. Uh, uh, intervention by the government in the market. So only 18% of the land is owned by the private sector. So here again, it's quite difficult because when land is owned by the government, it's, for example, leased out to the private sector, there are two things. One is the businessman cannot use it as a collateral to borrow. The second thing is when you have land that is not yours and leased out, it, uh, it just results in you're not going to invest permanently in that structure and you're not going to take good care of the land. So these are, I think it's a good move with the last budget that the president has decided to give away a lot of land to the farmers. But I think in my opinion, we need to give much more to a lot of landless uh, uh, farmers and others so that they can better utilize those lands uh, to improve the production of the country. Uh, again, labor laws, for example, opening in 1977, but they are almost about 70 years old. So they haven't been adapted to the uh, uh, changing world, or at least the 21st century, which means that we have one of the highest retrenchment costs in the world. So here again, uh, <laughs> when discussing with uh, investors, that is a key point that they highlight. So we need to have more robust uh, 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 labor laws. And coming to my last thing, uh, just want to point out the importance of, uh, for example, democracy and innovation. So if you look at, uh, since the talk I originally started was on uh, becoming a developed nation by 2048. So to move from upper middle income to the advanced economic category, if you look at all the countries that are developed, you'll see with the few exceptions, they're all democracies. With, there are a few oil states and city states. With the exception of them, almost all of them are uh, democracies. The reason is because you need democracy because when you cannot compete with low uh, wages, you need to have innovation to go on to the next stage. Innovation is very important. So that is what propels countries to stay as advanced countries. So, uh, so uh, for example, you need to have confidence to innovate. So. Uh, a reason the most advanced uh, economy, at least the largest economy in the world, is the US. So if you look at Silicon Valley, it's the, you know, the place for innovation. Everybody is allowed to think freely. They are allowed to do their ideas. It's okay to fail. So that sort of uh, mindset is, of course, to a certain extent, needed in an advanced economy. So uh, last year, I wrote a piece for the International Monetary Fund on... Uh, uh, economic growth and innovation, how they are related. So, which was uh, voted as seventh most popular IMF article for last year. So, here again, what we find is a fact most people don't uh, uh, tend to know is that about over, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, over 200 years ago, there was no such thing as economic growth. So it was only the economy only grew if the population grew or you started invading another country. So the whole idea of our econ economic growth was when innovation came in. You know, the steam engine came in. That led to Britain, you know, expanding its economy. The production increased. So it's mostly like the per capita productivity of an economy increases. Then we had the advanced shipping. Then in the 80s and 90s, the computers came in. So they increased our... Uh, productivity and lastly right now I think artificial intelligence and others they are going to really drive economic growth that will be the sort of the engine of growth uh, going forward so here again uh, if you look at innovation 
the most innovative country in the world uh, is Switzerland. So here again, Switzerland, it's something that it does for a particular reason. One of the reasons is that all the R&D is done by universities. So the industrial research and development is outsourced to universities. So once the universities start working on industrial problems, after a few companies, the universities become better at it. And the, even when the sixth or seventh company comes, they're able to provide a better solution rather than all these individual companies trying to work R&D on their own. So this also means that students coming out of those universities are put in to solve these problems before they graduate. So, they, so the workforce is already able to tackle most of the industrial problems. So this is one of the reasons that Switzerland remains uh, the most innovative economy uh, for, I think, nine consecutive years. So when I last spoke to President Ranil Vikramasinghe, I told him about this. So I think they also, the government also wants to focus on these areas. So uh, coming on to uh, my conclusion, so I think that uh, a lot of tough reforms are needed. And uh, it's not about Sri Lanka going to uh, a higher level. It's that in 1948, we were already a, a very good performing economy. Or I think almost second best. And called the Switzerland of Asia. It's just our journey back to where we lost ground. Back to the greatness we were uh, uh, about seven decades ago. At least if you can do that and go beyond, I think uh, it can benefit uh, uh, the whole country. So, <coughs> so with that, uh, so right now, Sri Lanka is at crossroads. So there are two choices. One is, of course, we can easily achieve stability, uh, though we cannot afford to stay for long in that area, and uh, you know get the loans, kick the can down the road, and somehow try to manage with higher, uh, a larger percentage of our revenues going to pay interest and others, like Argentina in repeatedly default. And I think if we go down this path with such a high public debt to GDP ratio, I think it's only a matter of time before we sort of default again. Or we can choose the other path, which is by India and Thailand. They did their hard reforms, and they never went to the IMF again. So it's really a, a question of uh, where, what sort of a thing we want to be. Is it are we going to choose the short-term comfortable uh, uh, way, or is it going to be like going through a little bit of tough uh, times, but having a more prosperous future for especially all of you all and for our kids. So that's uh, the question I want to leave the audience with. Thank you very much.